We're gonna okay. swap seats, We're so Everybody. people don't get confused. For those with a, uh, what's that syndrome where you can't recognize faces? Face blindness? No, yeah, what's it called? Face blindness. No, there's a, there's a, there's another, a fancier There's term a fancy name. So Someone in this room will know. This is, um, the room is empty over here if people want to move closer. There are cupcakes on that side. Yeah, and there's cupcakes, and it, it will be more socially awkward when you leave in the middle of our talk. So this is my first time wearing one of these TED-style microphones. And since you were kind of the guy behind the TED Talks, is that a fair statement? Yeah. <laughs> I've always wondered, are there different mics for different skin tones? Do you have like a, a, like a large Pantone like set of TED mics? Normally, the vendor who you rent it from has their specially colored you know, little covering for the mic. Got it. We should go because there's a ticking clock now. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Wishnow, and this is Jason Mojica. And we're going to talk about the new state of news um, online and offline on multiple platforms. And um, first of all, I just, I just want to hear, what's the, what can you tell me about Vice News and, like, just what Vice News is all about. You know, it's one of those things that people talk about a lot and it's on people's radars, but for you at the core, what are you trying to do? Sure, so I mean, Vice News started as a show on VBS.TV, which was uh, Vice's earliest incarnation of, uh, earliest experiment with online video. Um, so uh, along with various other shows about skateboarding and uh, food and things like that, uh, anything that kind of had information in it, we kind of slapped a Vice News logo on. Um, that led to uh, just kind of continuing to do big international documentaries around the world. And then in 2013, we decided to launch Vice News as a standalone. I could talk to you. That's right. This is supposed hey. to be a conversation. It makes me feel more secure because I'm like, I don't know. Who. Um, Go uh, on. <laughs> let me tell you more. I'll pretend, I'll pretend that no one's here and they're all naked. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so in 2013, we decided to launch Vice News as a standalone uh, video, standalone digital platform for news, uh, editorial content, uh, groundbreaking documentaries, uh, original video series, um, and and uh, and that's what we set out to do was to launch a very video-centric platform that was really documentary-driven because that's what we did uh, really well. So let's just cut to the chase and talk sure. about bringing Dennis Rodman to North Korea. <laughs> Uh, you did that, and that was that was huge. That was the final episode of the first season of Vice on HBO, and it was it was both it was rare to have you know an American go to North Korea and to meet a head of state, and you met the head of state, mm -hmm. and played basketball, and it's under the auspices of a new show and a documentary um, conducted by a bunch of guys covered in tattoos. Mm -hmm. So. Talk to me about that. <laughs> uh, well, well, okay, so I, I'll say that the way it ended up looking on film is not necessarily, people often think that the way things end up are the way they were planned. And, and I'll say that this all began with us trying to figure out how to get back into North Korea because we've made a number of films. Um, I mean, we'd made two films inside North Korea that were I would say, critical of the regime. Uh, myself and uh, Shane Smith and Simon Ostrovsky went to Far East Russia to do a story about North Korean labor camps that were being operated there. I also did a story called uh, Escape from North Korea, kind of about a South Korean pastor who was running an underground railroad helping defectors get out. So basically, there was this general idea that there is no chance in hell that North Korea is ever going to let us come in to make a film again. And kind of one of those spitballing ideas was like, well, what could we do that would make them somehow think it was a good idea to let us in? And we came, and someone talked about how Kim Jong Un was supposedly some big Chicago Bulls fan, like his father. So we, you know, started trying to figure out, well, could we maybe get a Chicago Bull and kind of dangle that in front of them? And and uh, so, you know, about a year later, the answer came down that yes, they would like us to please come uh, conduct this. Uh, basketball diplomacy mission 
um, and conduct a, a camp for North Korean uh, kids on you know, basketball training and things like that. Do you think it'll go down in the history books as basketball diplomacy, or is that what it's called around the vice office? Well, I guess, well, let's see uh, how things end up for that regime. Um, if, if we end up with yeah. peace, love, and understanding, then I'm happy to take full credit. Um, if we end up with uh, something worse than that, then I will deny all responsibility. Great. <laughs> so something like that strikes me as both, um, you know, there's news reportage that's happening when you're doing that, but also the news itself is, is almost just saying, Vice brought Dennis Rodman to North Korea. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, is, is the news what happened w within North Korea for you, or is the news also the, um, the event itself and the fact that in some ways this, is, uh, this could even just be part of you know, the grand scheme of vice expan media expansion in the world and building up vice's reputation and ad like advertising for vice? Well, I mean, certainly it you know, got a lot of attention and, and that being news was kind of everyone else responding to it. We were busy, we were there for about 12, 13 days and you know, we had our nose to the grindstone just working every day. And then we would come home at night and we actually had internet access in our hotel, which they actually you know, ran cables. They like, cut up the car carpet and ran cables and we had unfettered internet access. So we would go work on stories all day long and then come home and then do a little Google search and then find like 12,000 articles about what we were doing which we knew that no one had any information about. So it was really interesting because, I mean, I kind of came up in media studies and worked on a media review show called The Listening Post and Al Jazeera. So being, it was my first time being inside of a media event and watching everyone else comment and knowing that they are 100% full of shit because they don't know anything. Um, so it was really pretty fascinating. <laughs> right, I mean, not, not the right analogy, but it was entertaining to be sitting backstage and overhearing uh, the, the panel that was up on the stage speculating about the future of Vice News and huh. the future of um, the possibility of you know, a bigger deal with HBO and a nightly news program, you know, things that, things that are in the newspaper right now and people are talking about, mm -hmm. which we don't have to get into that right now. There's, there's still other things to talk about. Um, I like that you mentioned you were at Al Jazeera before, and um, and I think Al Jazeera is a really interesting organization because you know in the mid 2000s it it became a very prominent player in kind of Western Western news and you know uh, in an organization that was referenced. Uh, tell me, they switched to they started their English language. Yeah, about 2006, Al Jazeera English was launched. Okay. Al Jazeera Arabic about 96, 97, I'm forgetting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely a time where media is changing and news is changing. Um, since bringing Rodman to North Korea, you've continued to do you know, more really engaging stories with Vice, some of, them, some of which sound like very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I want to just talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, having uh, when I was in, we were talking about this backstage as well. When I was in China, I was doing a sci-fi film with Ai Weiwei that we had to we want we wound up you know being very discreet in how we would talk uh, talk to each other and and talk about doing this project where you know we were using code names and you know we were saving some correspondence for you know personal meetings as opposed to internet communications and all of this stuff that sounds really cloak and dagger and really, really, you know, dangerous, but also some of it was incredibly banal. Mm -hmm. And I think there's kind of a mixed impression of doing these types of dangerous pieces of, of journalism that you do. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to say just to the code names, I mean, our strategy was always uh, to especially in North Korea, wh you know, where we felt we as operated under the assumption that rooms were bugged. Um, we just kind of spoke in Star Wars analogies. So, you know, it was just kind of a, a cultural reference that everyone could understand and, and uh, <laughs> was very useful. But, but yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of things that are dangerous. There are things that look dangerous. There are things that seem really dangerous if to a person who's never 
been in a situation like that. Um, but I think the most important part for us, I mean, as much as we do often find ourselves in conflict and crisis zones, is to really focus on the humanity of those situations and, I mean, really to tell the human stories and, and really to try and show what a place is like. Um, and, 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 and perhaps, I wouldn't say most importantly, but um, to demonstrate that there is humor in those situations, that humor is one of the ways that people cope with these incredibly challenging times. And, um, and that's something you don't often see in news because they don't think that that's the time and place for jokes. But if you're in those situations, if you know, you're know you in Eastern Congo <laughs> in the middle of a refugee camp, people there are uh, make, making jokes. And, and, and it's dark, dark humor <laughs> at times. But and, and you get into places like the Congo and stuff. And um, you, know, you were talking about how uh, like Vice News went in and met with Al-Qaeda operatives, right? Is that? Um, or was it out? No, well, I know you did tell uh, The Islamic State was a okay, right. big one, yeah, in Raqqa. Okay, so you met with the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're calling, do you just call the Islamic State on the phone and say, hey, I'm a journalist, can I come and talk to you, don't behead me? Or do you say, or do you say, hey, it's Vice, and, and all these guys from the Islamic State are like, oh, cool, like, <laughs> I've got a skateboard. <laughs> like, how does that work out? Like, how... Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, that yeah, when we went, it was June of last year, which was kind of before the recent spate of public uh, murders of journalists. So, um, you know, it, at, at, at the time, it didn't seem like the craziest idea we'd ever thought of. Um, and the interesting thing, I mean, I get asked about that a lot, and people ask how we pulled that off. And the answer is very unsatisfying to people, which is kind of as you put it, we asked. Um, so yeah, without revealing too much of the tradecraft involved, but yeah, basically there was an ask and then they discussed it and, uh, and apparently decided that this would be a good strategic move for them. Um, you know, a, a, and, but this also gets to, I mean, one of my favorite aspects of journalism is that it is kind of a combat and between the two parties involved in, in that there are two, you know, when someone agrees to let you into their life uh, to, or it gives you an access to a military unit, you know, they are hoping to get something out of it. You're hoping to get something out of it. They're probably not the same thing. They probably shouldn't be the same thing. And, and then what happens is, you know, the battle of them trying to make sure you see it their way and you trying to extract the information you're trying to get out of them. Yeah. Um, and I mean, if you're a person like me, that's a good time. Well, um, you know, an argu arguments could be made about the state of journalism and, you know, it kind of getting dumbed down as part of the 24-hour news cycle and, you know, your, your types of vice documentaries, you know, are highly entertaining, mm -hmm. you know, and so they fall into this category of, you know, entertainment and journalism as a hybrid and, you know, as something that came up from, you know, being a zine and then being a magazine with, you know, with as much raciness as you could like fit into the pages. And, um, and do you feel like, and an argument could also be made, you know, I, I used to work at TED and, you know, um, one of the things that, you know, I, I take great pride in what we were able to pull off at TED was taking these very complex sort of like state academic lectures and making them entertaining and adding an element of entertainment to them that would m add an emotional impact so that we could reach, you know, a great idea could reach a broader audience. Um, and a critique of that might be, you know, is sometimes that, oh, is Ted just the diluted version of this really complex idea? Uh, you know, I'm I come from the inside, so I can be hypercritical of myself. But you know, <laughs> what aspects of what you're doing are you hypercritical of? Well, first, I just want to talk about you know the TED talks. I, I, as I told you before, you know something that I when I, I watch the all the time while cooking dinner, and I watch them regardless of what the topic is because I know that there is going to be a storytelling element that makes me interested in that topic of. Um, so it is a place where I go and I learn something that I did not know 
and that I certainly wouldn't have thought that I would care about. Um, and so, you know, you talk about our news being entertaining. I think it really just is trying to make that connection or trying to tell a story because otherwise no one cares. Um, it's, it's hard to get people to care about an earthquake in Nepal unless you have no people in Nepal. And, and so, you know, when, when we can tell a story, I, I mean, it really, f as much as I love being called innovative, um, I mean, really, this is kind of Don Hewitt's bag. I mean, this is the, the 60 Minutes maxim. This is tell me a story. And um, and that's how we get people to care. And, and, and really, I, I also think that this comes from, oh, I see we're out of time. The last thing, I mean, my approach to news and the approach I try to instill is I wasn't always a news junkie. I didn't grow up as a news junkie. I didn't necessarily care about the world. And at a point where I started to figure that out, or where I started to care, I've basically tried to approach everything as talking to a younger version of myself that didn't understand why they should care about an earthquake in Nepal. Um, and so, so that is the approach that I think is what is so engaging for a younger audience. So. That's fantastic. I, l I love ending on that note. I mean, you know, our, our approach with TED was how do you share an intellectual idea in a way that's also going to hit you on an emotional level as well. So that's, that was our little takeaway. And your takeaway as an audience who's, um, who sat through our talk is <laughs> that um, there was a party last night for DLD and we realized that there was no party for after DLD was over. So one, so one of the attendees <laughs> Um, and I were talking, and we've come up with an after party for the conference that's now been sanctioned by the conference. <laughs> um, so if you still want to catch up with people and talk about this stuff, and maybe even find Jason and Jason to watch us fight some more, or watch us fight for real, the DLD after party is going to be at a place called Elvis's Guest House, which is on Avenue A. And it's 85 Avenue A, and there's a drink special for all the DLD attendees from 9 to 11.30. So you're all welcome to come to an after party. <laughs> thank you, guys. And Steffi will bring this up again. <laughs> OK, thank you, everyone. Pleasure, sir.